and welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Priya Menon, your host. Today on Cure Talks, we are discussing lung cancer mutations and treatment advances. We have with us Dr. Shikhevan Shukat, Professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology, and Dr. Trevor Bivona, Medical Oncologist, Professor of Medicine of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology at UCSF Helen Villa Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. On the patient experts panel, we have lung cancer advocates Jerry Conran and Lisa Goldman. Welcome to Cure Talks, everyone. I'm going to jump to right in. This is there is a new drug out there. It is sotorasib, sotorasib for G12C. Now, I think people who follow the oncology drug space they will know that trying to drug KRAS has been the holy grail of oncology for a long time. Dr. Shokat, you are one of the frontline researchers working on KRAS mutations. Can you talk a bit about why it has been so hard? to drug KRAS, and why is KRAS so interesting to lung cancer researchers? Sure, thank you, Priya, thanks for inviting me. Well, we've, we've known about KRAS uh, mutations in cancer since 1983. It was actually the first human oncogene to be identified. And then it started uh, being, it was aware, we were aware that it occurred as a driver uh, oncogene in lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, et cetera. And so once you identify the mutation that is driving the cancer, that opens it up as a target for drug discovery. The problem with KRAS is that it's a very small protein that really has no pockets that we usually think of for binding to, to drugs. It's You could think of it as a bowling ball uh, and if a drug is like your fist, then you will just never be able to get it into uh, the, the ball. And that was the real limitation for everybody uh, for the last 35 years. Then um, a number of years ago, my lab decided that maybe we shouldn't try to solve all of the um, KRAS mutant cancers. We should just focus on the one that's more frequent in lung cancer. And that uh, was caused by this G12C mutation or glycine 12 to cysteine. And cysteine has a special chemical reactivity. So it's like a little piece of super glue. And so we identified a drug that could hold on to the glue, even though it's on the surface of the bowling ball. And that led to the identification of the pocket. And then, then it became a drug discovery effort. And the drug you mentioned, Sotorasib, was just approved by binding to that pocket and turning off KRAS. And that's really a great benefit, I think, to lung cancer patients with this particular mutation. Uh, Dr. Bhuvana, you're no stranger to targeted therapies in lung cancer. When you think about targeted therapies, what are the drugs that you're using often? And uh, what are some of the response rates you're expecting to see? First, thank you uh, for the invitation to be here. It's, it's wonderful to be part of the panel. Um, and so many of the drugs, uh, like sotorasib, um, that we're using in the clinic now um, are against other driver oncogenes, as Dr. Shokat described, uh, that really cause the cancer to, to grow and to spread. Um, and these are genes like EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor, um, variants of um, uh, ALK, the anaplastic lymphoma kinase, that are gene fusions. Um, and so those are two of the more uh, common ones and the more uh, well-validated targets. Um, and the drugs we're using against those uh, are, um, are, are like sotorasib in the sense that they're very potent and, and, and relatively specific, especially uh, osimertinib, uh, which is similar in that it binds directly to, to EGFR in the same way uh, or in a similar manner uh, as, as sotorasib to KRAS, a, a particular cysteine. Um, and for ALK, uh, um, drugs like uh, electinib, which are, which are again highly potent and specific and very effective in patients, um, and also um, uh, very well tolerated, so very safe uh, in patients, which is, which is as important. Um, the response rates to, to EGFR and ALK inhibitors are, 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 these EGFR and ALK inhibitors specifically are actually quite high. They can be on the order of uh, 80% or, or even higher in some cases. And so those inhibitors against EGFR and ALK are used in the first line setting and they can provide benefit for sometimes years in patients. Thank you. Dr. Shokat, one of the exciting stories, as I said, um, I think past few months for lung cancer has been this KRAS G12 story. Uh, and we've got multiple drugs that have been evaluated and an FDA approval for um, this one as of June. Can you talk briefly uh, at high level about this data? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, when 
a, a molecule first is able to target a, an oncogene and we put it into the clinic in patients that all have that driver oncogene, then we get to see, well, what happens when we shut it off? And it, the response rates are, are in the 35 to 40% range. So interestingly, much lower than the EGFR uh, response rates that Trevor uh, described. So we're all trying to understand, is that some distribution of other mutations that occur or whether combination therapies, which I think we'll talk about, uh, have a much better chance here to uh, expand the response rates and the depth of responses, or whether this is just the first drug, the, the one that Trevor mentioned, osimertinib, is a so-called third-generation EGFR inhibitor, whereas sotorasib is just the first-generation KRAS inhibitor. So it's, it, it probably will improve. I think certainly it will improve, uh, but um, there's still a long way to go to sort of really get to the maximum benefit we can achieve uh, through this mechanism. So finally, uh, I mean, I think the last line here is that we have a drug that targets something we could never target before. And that's, uh, uh, that's very exciting for lung cancer. Um, Dr. Bivona, where do we go with these drugs? Um, you know, are they single agents? Are they in combinations? Do we use it in combinations? And if yes, so what do we use it with? You know, is it first line? Are we planning it for a reserve for second line? And how, how do we move forward for these? Yeah, this is a very important question. And, um, you know, I think in many different directions. One is building upon the tremendous success of sotoracid and, and inhibitors like it. Um, as Dr. Shokat mentioned, uh, you know, uh, developing perhaps even, you know, um, uh, uh, better forms of those types of drugs, like osimertinib is uh, a third generation inhibitor, as, uh, which is better than the first and second generation agent for inhibitors. So that's certainly one area um, in terms of drug development and clinical development. Um, and then what you're alluding to, uh, you know, what are the rational combination approaches that, that can be used um, to enhance the effects of, uh, of soda acid? Um, uh, and this is, these are uh, uh, common themes across EGFR and ALK and other driver oncogenes. Uh, we're trying to enhance response to these, you know, to these agents through combination therapies. Um, in order for combination therapies to be successful in the clinic, you know, they must um, be grounded in, in sort of a mechanistic basis. And so I think one of the first important avenues of research is to try to understand what limits response to, to current inhibitors against D12C and, and other, and others, um, uh, other uh, inhibitors. Um, and so some of the combinations that are being explored uh, are um, targeting other proteins that help turn KRAS on, uh, either upstream or that help mediate the effects of KRAS downstream and cause cancer cells to grow. Um, and so uh, there are upstream receptors like EGFR even, um, uh, there are proteins um, such as SHP2 or SHP2, which helps to act, helps to promote RAS signaling uh, and cancer growth. And then there are downstream uh, you know, targets such as MEK and, and ERK that mediate the effects of RAS and cause the cancer cells to grow. So a lot of those combination therapies are being explored. Um, and then, you know, I think sec uh, secondly, uh, combinations with other uh, other important um, uh, treatments in, in lung cancer and other cancers, such as checkpoint inhibitors, so immunotherapy. So, so there is some uh, mechanistic data to support combinations of, of G12C inhibitors um, uh, and, and RAS pathway inhibitors in general with checkpoint inhibitors, so immunotherapy. And those are very exciting because uh, that potentially leverages the immune system and the interactions between uh, the RAS signaling and the cancer cells and, and the immune system being able to, uh, to really effectively uh, help eliminate the cancer cells uh, in the body. Um, and then where do we go from here? I think, you know, certainly moving towards first-line therapies um, for D12C inhibitors alone, and, and also uh, some of these combination therapies, should they prove effective um, in later lines of therapy. Uh, that's certainly how the EGFR and, and ALK um, uh, uh, lung cancer uh, subtypes has, have evolved, um, where now osimertinib is the first-line treatment uh, for EGFR mutant patients, and, and electinib or, or other agents like it in, in ELK. So I think um, that certainly is the way forward in terms of what line of therapy, um, hopefully first line. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to hand it over to the patient panel now. Our first panelist is Terry Conran. Since 2017, Terry has been battling KRAS stage three lung cancer. She founded KRAS Kickers in 2019 to create a network for patients and families in search of KRAS information and support. Terry, over to you for your questions. Hey, hey, I gotta say thank you for inviting me and it's, it's a great honor to be able to speak with everybody this evening about this. I um, just kind of wanted to start off like a fun question. All right, we've heard about undruggable and KRAS and whatever. 
what is like the best metaphor that you've heard as far as like getting getting into that pocket? Yeah, I I think of it as, you know, you know, climbing Mount Everest, you know, there's many paths people take uh, before you reach the summit. Everybody knew it was there, as I said, for 40 years. Uh, and even as we were taking our approach along the way, we had many hurdles. A lot of the early indications when we found the pocket, uh, people, good friends and experts told me that it wouldn't work because the pocket was too shallow or it was in the wrong form of the protein. But, you know, we, we weren't, we didn't have any other uh, trail to go on. So we just kept going. And luckily along the way, uh, you know, things uh, came our way and, and the opportunity, you know, the weather cleared if you, if you want, and we got there. And uh, the other thing about Mount Everest, that uh, metaphor is that now there are so many people going there and there's so many other approaches and trails. And, and so I, I'm really excited about that. 10 years ago, I don't think there was this sort of, uh, you know, momentum to go after uh, this, this important oncogene. It's a good analogy. Um, how about you, Dr. Pavona? Do you have a, a favorite one? Yeah, I mean, I would think of it as sort of, you know, we were, we, we, there was sort of a, you know, a traffic jam and, and Dr. Shokat and, and his colleagues, you know, found sort of the, uh, you know, the off ramp to get around it. And so, I mean, I think that really has now exploded, um, you know, the field. Um, I think it, in, in many ways, and, and Dr. Shokat can speak to this perhaps better than I can, but there was sort of a, a bit, 10 years ago, there may have been some fatigue around, oh, you know, we, we'll just throw in the towel against KRAS and, um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, the transformative work by, by Dr. Shokat and others is really, um, again, just, just completely, um, alleviated this, this traffic jam. That's a valid point that you need to keep like plugging through, um, through the trailblazing, even though you are getting very fatigued. So I, for one, I'm very happy that you guys kept going through it and making the trail to continue on. Um, okay. So since this is taking more than one path to get there. Do you anticipate, Dr. Shokat, if it's going to be upstream, downstream, or is it just going to be some version of a combo that's really going to take it to really make the next level approach? Yeah, I, to me, one of the most exciting combinations is actually one that uh, Dr. Vona found, which is a, a protein he mentioned, SHIP2, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that is upstream. And you normally think if you know the problem is downstream, then you should work below. You shouldn't really work upstream. But I think his uh, his studies showed that actually the upstream signal did sort of impact how the oncogene worked. So, and it just so happened that a couple of years before the G12C drugs came out, that upstream protein was drugged. It was its own undruggable, uh, and that that was very fortuitous that we have a, a fantastic uh, option there to combine a SHIP2 inhibitor with a KRAS inhibitor. So I think once that plays out, we'll really uh, get a big movement on the needle. Personally, I think the next sort of layer of combination we need is, you know, we've been talking about KRAS as the oncogene, the flip side of that in cancer genetics is the tumor, are the tumor suppressors, which we lose. And we think we know we sort of by the numbers, it looks like about 50% of lung cancer KRAS patients also have lost P53. So I think if we could sort of reactivate the tumor suppressive effect uh, that has been lost, that we, you know, genetically and in models we know would be a huge uh, anti uh, cancer benefit. So there are some drugs that kind of mimic a part of P53, the so-called CDK4-6 inhibitors. Um, but I think there's some next ideas coming around. So that I think will, we'll, if we can start to engage tumor suppressive activities, uh, this will be a real uh, big, big, you know, step. So it's not just turning off the mutant, it's keeping what's wild and healthy to be work doing its part too, right? Exactly. Okay. Okay. I just make sure I understand, right? I'm not a yeah. scientist. Okay. You captured it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Fona, would you kind of like elaborate a little bit on the ship too? Yeah. As well, as Dr. Shokat alluded to, um, you know, we, we were studying um, in a collaboration with a, a biotech company in, 
in the Bay Area here, um, ship two as a target in and of its own right, um, independent of, of G12C necessarily. And um, the take home message was that what we found was that certain cancers, even if they have RAS mutations like this G12C mutation, still require some push up from upstream. And so I think that the dogma in the field had been for, for, for decades that if there was a RAS mutation, be it G12C or another form of, of, of RAS mutations that causes the cancer, it doesn't really need any push from proteins upstream in the cell. And that it was just sort of an autonomous, uh, you know, constitutively active, that's what we call it, um, uh, you know, switch. And so there was no, uh, it was a, it was essentially like flipping a light switch as opposed to being sort of on a dimmer. Um, and so what we found, I think, by analogy was that um, G12C actually functions a little bit more like a dimmer than, than a strict light switch on or off. And that it, therefore one could, SHIP2 was actually essentially turning, turning up the brightness of a light a bit in terms of the G12C. So it was turning it on even more um, by analogy. And so therefore blocking SHIP2, which as Dr. Shokat mentioned was also undruggable until recent developments uh, by, by many drug developers in the field, blocking it with a small molecule actually suppressed the activity of G12C. Um, even on its own, independent of a G12C inhibitor. And, um, and so that became the basis for testing at SHIP2 inhibitors in, in KRAS G12C cancers. Um, but I think the real you know, powerful approach, uh, I agree with Dr. Shokan, is, is the combination where you really turn KRAS off and then you really clamp down on it by also, uh, by also turning off the SHIP2 protein that, um, you know, that again is giving KRAS a little bit of an extra push. Okay, and how do you think we're gonna be able to apply this to some of the other KRAS um, Mutations. Um, you, which one? Yeah, I'm sorry. Which one? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Trevor. Go ahead. Well, I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Shokan on this in terms of the drug development, but there are there are very creative approaches I think to um, target RAS in different ways. So there are other pockets that have been identified. Um, I, again, on the heels of of the breakthrough work by Dr. Shokat. Um, there are other approaches um, uh, to um, take advantage of interactions between RAS and certain proteins in cells um, to uh, create um, sort of a, a glue um, to, to dock small molecules that, that can block KRAS. And so, um, you know, I think the next frontier are developing, uh, you know, small molecule drugs that go beyond G12C and can target some of the other important forms uh, Dr. Shoket mentioned pancreatic cancer, and um, you know uh, there are other forms of, of KRAS like G12D that are more common in, you know, than G12C in pancreatic cancer, for example, and um, and even in lung cancer there are other forms beyond G12C uh, like G12D and G12B, and all these are oncogenes; they all cause cancer, uh, but they can't be targeted in exactly the same way as, as the G12C can. And so these other approaches, I think, are the next frontier there. Would, would you elaborate a little bit, Dr. Shoket? Sure. Yeah, the, I think uh, Dr. Bonas summarized it well. And and these other these other mutations that drive cancer, you know, they don't have that super glue of the cysteine, um, the the glycine twelve to aspartate, which occurs in, in lung cancer and very frequently in pancreatic. It's sort of like the glue that's on a post-it note. It, it's much weaker, and we don't have all the right tools to make that a permanent sort of uh, attachment. But there are a lot of uh, creative uh, approaches going on. And uh, I, I think we'll see that in the next sort of six to nine months in the literature. And I bet in the clinic, we will see those molecules enter in, um, you know, probably the second half of 2022. So yeah, I think there's really that, that, that sort of uh, groundswell and rush to uh, the G12C has really motivated everybody and now, basically every approach is on the table and some of them have, you know, I wouldn't have thought they would have worked as well as they have. And so we're getting a lot of really exciting data. A lot of it is in companies now, so we don't get to see it except in uh, sort of press releases, but the real science will come out soon, I think. I'm, I'm hopeful. I know that that's a huge, I'm, I'm also not a G12C, but there's a huge population. And I, I recently saw, I don't know the exact number, but something like G12D and G12V make up all the largest portion of all cancer in under KRES. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's sort of like 45% is G12D. It's maybe 30% G12V. 
and then like 25% C and then a few others, yeah. Yeah, because proportionately, I think it was um, chemist G12C represents about the same number of people in lung cancer as have EGFR lung cancer. And so once you start winding it out past the KVAS, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm not telling, I'm asking, is that correct? Yeah, Trevor probably knows the distribution better than I do. Um, yeah, that's how that, EGFR that's, compares. Well, that's about right. And it, it depends a little bit on the, on the um, you know, the, um, uh, the demographics and the patient population, but I would say here in the, in the United States, that's about accurate. It's a huge number of people. Well, thank you guys both so much for everything that you're doing, climbing, you know, getting us to climb Mount Everest without, and being able to trailblaze. My, my favorite um, metaphor that they used was Death Star, breaking down the Death Star of mm. cancer. That was, was my favorite. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa Goldman, who has, I'm sure, some fantastic questions, much more technical. Thank you, Terry, for all you do with the KRAS kickers. It's great seeing them on Twitter. So. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And we might be able to hook you up with a, a pen and a cup for both of you. <laughs> I'm all in for the swag. <laughs> all right. I'm, I'm down for it. <laughs> Next on the panel, we have Lisa Goldman. Lisa is one of the founders and the president of the Arrows Wonders uh, Inc., a nonprofit corporation representing the largest collection of ROS1 patients in the world. She was diagnosed with stage four NCLC in Jan 2014 at the age of 41. Yeah, Lisa. Now you can ask your questions. Yes. So uh, since I'm a, a ROS1 patient, um, I'm going to shift the conversation a little more general uh, away from the, the focus on KRAS and ask just some questions that I often um, hear because uh, I, I get a lot of questions from ROS1 patients or other uh, lung cancer patients, not necessarily ROS1, just as um, an active advocate in the lung cancer space. So um, one question that's been coming up a lot, and I don't know if either of you have uh, thoughts on this, is people are starting to ask me, what is CRISPR technology and can it be used to treat genomically driven cancers? Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you first, Trevor, and then shift. Sure, it's nice to see you, Lisa. Good to see um, you. Again, thanks for, for, for having us. Um, so CRISPR is a very, very powerful uh, approach for genome editing. So it's a way to sort of edit DNA um, in, um, you know, in, in cells in the laboratory and now more recently even potentially in, in patients. Um, you know, and so this is, a, a, you know, this is a different approach to treating you know, disease. It's not sort of using you know, molecules and drugs, but it's using um, uh, uh, sort of uh, basically um, uh, you know, certain um, uh, an instruction manual that allows uh, basically one to go in and, and again rewire the DNA of a cell. Um, and so th this technology actually was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, as you, as you may have heard. Um, and, um, and it's one approach to, to say, for example, um, uh, go in and try to, to fix or correct uh, you know, a mutation that, that's an oncogenic mutation. And you know, there are experiments going on that, that are testing that to, in academics and in industry. Um, and, um, and, and they're slowly moving towards the clinic. It, as you can imagine, it's quite technical. Um, and uh, there's a host of sort of you know, safety issues to, to think about uh, when, when tinkering with, with you know, human beings DNA um, and altering it in powerful ways. But this is something that is sort of potentially a, a next frontier, although I think a, a, bit, a bit out from kind of clinical practice in terms of oncology, um, or at least in terms of the oncogenes and lung cancer space. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I, I think it's uh, fantastic technology. Uh, it's it's it's, uh, it's mind-boggling to think the hurdles that have to be overcome to make it apply in cancer. But like we've been talking about overcoming hurdles, you know, you really don't know until you try. So it's great to see so many people working on it. Okay, great. Thanks. It has been used successfully. Just in, on a side note, um, you know, recently in in some other you know in some other human diseases, so sickle cell disease, for example, and again, not cancer, different context, but but so there is you know to echo Dr. Shokat's you know um, optimism, I, I think that there is you know significant obstacles, but but it potentially could work over the longer term. Great. Um Dr. Babona, I think you talked uh, a few minutes ago about combining different types of treatments like immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Another question that comes up a lot, especially to me personally, because I uh, diagnosed back in 2014, I started on chemotherapy before my 
uh, biomarker was discovered and I shifted to targeted therapy. But a lot of people wonder if my longevity on the targeted therapy has something to do with my taking chemotherapy first. And so patients often ask me, should I do chemotherapy at some point before I start a target therapy or alongside my targeted therapy? Do either of you have thoughts on combining um, chemotherapy or when uh, oncogene-driven cancer patients or patients with oncogene-driven cancers, I should say, uh, should incorporate chemother- traditional chemotherapy? Well, I think from the clinical standpoint, you know, it's an excellent question. I, I think that the, you know, the jury's still out in, in, in across most, um, most examples like EGFR and Ross and others. Um, you know, I, the, what the data have shown is that if you compare, say, an EGFR inhibitor or a ROS1 inhibitor to conventional chemotherapy, not together, but you know, uh, side by side, um, you know, we know that the targeted therapy is superior. And it's also generally, you know, better tolerated for, in most examples of that. Um, there are certain cl- you know, uh, clinical trial studies that have shown that in some cases there can be a benefit to combining them in certain situations. Although again, um, EGFR is an example there. Um, but again, those are not approved regimens and I think that's still an area of ongoing research. So I would say for the most part, um, uh, in a situation where you have a biomarker, where there's an approved therapy like ROS1 or, or, or G12C now, or, or you know, EGFR, ALK, um, still the, the best option in terms of uh, efficacy and safety is the targeted therapy alone. I would say the one area uh, that's, again, you know, where there could be rationale um, and, and um, uh, utility is, is in the drug resistance setting, you know, and so once the cancer has become resistant to, you know, a ROS1 inhibitor or an ALK inhibitor or an EGFR inhibitor, um, you know, there in some cases, chemotherapy can, can you know, can help, um, uh, particularly where there's not sort of the next, you know, uh, ALK inhibitor or the next, you know, RAS inhibitor or the next combination therapy immediately available. That makes sense. Um, a, a question, uh, maybe Dr. Shohat can field this one first. Uh, a, another question I get is, if targeted therapy is targeted, why am I still experiencing side effects? So um, I, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, chemo, uh, targeted therapy is a lot more tolerable than, than chemotherapy. However, people still do have uh, struggles with it. So can you explain a little bit about why people are experiencing that? That is a fantastic question. Um, And it is a targeted therapy because it hits one protein usually. uh, And rather than chemotherapy, which sort of puts, you know, a lot of damage around for the cell to try to deal with, and usually it will die, but that happens to normal tissue as well. The targeted therapy, even though it hits one protein, it hits the protein as it's mutated in the tumor cell, but it it also inhibits the original wild type normal form of the protein in the rest of the body. And so when we talk about therapeutic index, we hope that the tumor is much more sensitive than the normal cells, but that toxicity is because it inhibits the, the target in the normal tissues. Now, what's great about uh, the third generation EGFR inhibitor osimertinib that we talked about earlier is it has a, uh, a wild type sparing effect. So it does a little bit more on the tumor cell than it does in the rest of the body, but it's not exclusive. The KRAS drug is really exciting because it is exclusive for the tumor. So as we get more and more, I I think of these as more third generation targeted therapies where they should work the way you exactly, uh, hopefully, you know, we we wanted all targeted therapy to work. So now we're really working to get that. And that's a a drug design challenge, but we're doing that. I'll go back to a basic one um, that I get a lot. So people get confused and ask me, what's the difference between getting uh, genomic testing or uh, genetic testing? How do I know my, do I already know my biomarker? I already got tested for, for example, BRCA or something like that. Can um, maybe Dr. Favona, you can take this one. Sure. So the, you know, the, the, the biomarkers that we've been talking about today lung cancer and um, you know, certain other cancer types beyond lung cancer are, are exclusive to the, to the cancer cells. So there's been a, a, a process in the DNA in the cancer cells that gave rise to 
these mutations. They are not present in, in the normal cells in, in your body. And so those are acquired or what we call somatic mutations. Um, so this, these are ROS1, ALK, uh, the KRAS G12C, the EGFR mutations, right? Um, a different class of, of, of and so that those would be sort of, you know, tumor genomic mutations specifically to the tumor cells, right? Um, there are a different class of mutations that can be inherited from one generation to, to, to another, so from one's parents to, to ch the children. And those are, those are um, hereditary mutations. Um, and those are, you know, um, um, uh, those are um, in, often in, um, in tumor suppressor genes. So an example is the breast cancer susceptibility gene called BRCA that, that you may have heard about. Um, so that's inherited from, from one's, you know, from one's um, uh, ancestors. Um, the, um, uh, so so the, 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 the genetic testing that's done would be if there's a familial pattern of cancer, um, uh, of cancer pathogenesis in the family. Um, in lung cancer, there are no examples of that, or very rare examples of that, I should say. There's one, one, pro one prominent one that's um, actually in EGFR called the T790M mutation, which is a mutation that causes resistance to the first uh, generation EGFR inhibitors, very rarely 1% or less uh, of the population contains a, that mutation as germline, so hereditary, and that can be passed down. But that is by far, you know, not the rule. That's by far the exception, right? Um, uh, so by and large, when we're talking about lung cancer biomarkers, we are, we are talking about tumor genomic testing and not these hereditary mutations that are, that are inherited. So patients won't, won't have the ability to test for that prior to a diagnosis. So any kind of genetic testing that they may have done is inapplicable here and they still need to go for biomarker testing. I just wanted to clarify that for people. Yes, absolutely. So if you've had genetic testing for whatever reason, for, um, you know, for, for some reason in the past, um, if you're diagnosed with cancer, then it's, you know, it's imperative to have the tumor biomarker testing done in addition. Um, I will say there's an area, a burgeoning area of research that's trying to detect cancers earlier using DNA sequencing technology. Uh, for example, um, liquid biopsies where we can take a blood sample and sequence DNA that's in the blood circulation. And so again, not, uh, not ready for prime time yet, but there are efforts to, um, to try to do early, uh, try to detect cancers early uh, by, by essentially screening. So pre-diagnostic assays of, of high risk in uh, patients for, or individuals, for example. Um, but again, um, as it stands today, uh, you know, this is um, biomarker testing that would need to be done after a diagnosis of, of, of cancer, um, independent of any prior genetic testing that, that one has had. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thanks for all those questions. Uh, I'm gonna circle back to Keras here. Uh, Dr. Shukat, it, uh, the drug has been found to be responsive against other cancers too, like uh, colon, ovarian, and other solid Keras tumors. Um, so definitely there's more to come from this group of drugs. Can you uh, talk a little bit on that? Yeah, the you know when the mutation occurs in in any tissue, uh, that sotorasib uh, would be a very very viable molecule, to, a drug to try to get a response. Um, it's very interesting, and it's an area of of really deep current research why the response rates are different in lung cancer and colon cancer of the same drug when the same mutation is there. And that's because other mutations come along that are different in colon and, and lung. And so um, that it, it, to say that it will always respond um, is, is, doesn't look to be true, but um, it, it certainly will probably be one of the drugs people use, but there probably need to be different drugs combined to go after the other tissues. And then the next level is something uh, I, I think we spoke about with, with Terry about other KRAS drugs that are on their way. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Vivona, can we talk a little bit about the eligibility for this drug and uh, the time period that we're looking at? And have you started uh, you know, administering this in your clinics right now? Some, oh, some, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, absolutely. So, sotorasib, yes, I think is um, is now in clinical use. So, we, you know, we use we treat uh, patients with G12C lung cancer. You know, with sotorasib. Um, uh, there is another um, G12C inhibitor uh, called adagrasib that's also coming along and will probably be FDA approved soon, um, uh, relatively soon. Don't know the exact timing. Um, so, there will be multiple um, G12C inhibitors that um, you know that uh, are available for for G12C inhibitor patients. 
Um, and that's very exciting. And there, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, ex excellent uh, effects in patients. So I think the clinical trial data, you know, are playing out in the real world, so to speak. Oh, that's good. Uh, so there's a lot of enthusiasm here. Uh, and I think I'd be curious to see as we move these drugs up front, whether the response rates will increase. Uh, uh, so it's uh, quite exciting for uh, the oncology uh, field. Um, with that, I would be wrapping up today's discussion. Uh, Dr. Shokar, Dr. Bibona, thank you so very much for taking time today to join us on Cure Talks. Um, Terry, I hope this discussion will be useful for the KRAS community. Um, Terry and Lisa, thank you for joining and asking uh, great questions and bringing in the patient's perspective here. Uh, we thank also uh, UCS at Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. The talk will be available on curedogs.com. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for thank having you, me. Thank you, Priya. Thank you very much.